Well, Raja, thank you for your time. Uh, I'm yeah. Stephen Clark from spaceflightnow.com. So uh, just wanted to get to know you a little bit. And can you, first of all, kick it off uh, for a minute or two and talk about your background and uh, your, your family, where you grew up, and your experience to get to the astronaut corps? Sure, yeah. Uh, so I grew up in Iowa where I met my wife as well. So we're both from Cedar Falls, Iowa. Uh, I went to the Air Force Academy uh, and then from there went to graduate school and then flew operationally. I flew F-15Es in the Air Force. Uh, eventually went to test pilot school. Um, during that time, my wife was an attorney. So she would move with me every time and have to retake the bar. Uh, when I went to test pilot school, she started uh, working for the Department of Veterans Affairs uh, in D.C. And they let her start uh taking her work mobile with her as I continued to move, uh, went from there, um, do F-15 test, and then went, uh, did some schooling, some more schooling, and then worked in DC um, doing program management, and then wound up at Edwards Air Force Base. Uh, I was the running the F-35 F test squadron out at Edwards, and then got picked up to become an astronaut, and then, so, and then here I am. Uh, so I was in the 2017 class along with Kayla, who's also in the crew, and uh, now here with four years uh, and some change later, heading to, head to space. So your mission is the first time, I'm sure you know this, the first time a rookie space flyer has been commander of a NASA mission, I think, since uh, Skylab, uh, one of the Skylab missions. Uh, I'm curious, uh, uh, I asked Tom Marshburn about what leadership you bring to the crew, and he was very laudatory, of course. And uh, uh, But I'm curious, you know, given the automated nature of the Crew Dragon, if maybe going forward, you know, having a lot of space flight experience isn't as vital as it maybe it once was. I think it's not even so much the, the dragon vehicle as it is the, I think it's more testament to the training we get. Um, I think that uh, really, you know, NASA has done a great job over the years of taking feedback on the training process. And I think the space station has given us now 20 years of experience of knowing what training we need and what training we don't need and really honing the process. And I think the the proof of that was the 2013 class had several people on orbit that were rookies simultaneously. And early on, when they kind of realized that many people were going to be up there that had no space flight experience, there was some consternation initially. And then once it happened and everything went flawlessly, they did all rookie spacewalks multiple times. And everyone's like, oh, this is kind of a non-event. Uh, I think it's, it's more the fact that the training is much better and we, we know uh, how to train people that it is more than, you know, anything about the vehicle specific. And I think in our particular case, you know, I, having Tom Marshburn on the crew who's a veteran has been, you know, hugely beneficial as we go through the training uh, for him to pipe in and, and be a teacher for all of us to like, hey, this surprised me in space or this is not going to work the way you think it's worked. And uniquely to him as well, not just a veteran, but a veteran of a shuttle and Soyuz. So he's seen life in a small capsule. He's seen life on a, you know, a larger machine in the shuttle, he's seen life and long duration on the ISS. So he's got that wide breadth of experience to kind of help um, inform our training as we've gone through. And, and the reality is the commander role is not so much a, you know, a, a technical role. It's more of a coach role, just similar to like, I use the analogy, I probably overuse the analogy, but it's basically a professional athletics team. You know, the, the coach of an NBA team isn't actually like teaching you know, a player how to shoot the ball, they're more trying to figure out how to make the team work best in different situations. It's, it's very similar uh, here. It's like, you know, a fire response crew coordination effort is different than a depressed response crew coordination effort. And so knowing what resources people wise to put on different problems for different situations is really my job. Will you be doing any manual flying on this mission if everything's nominal or is it all automated? So everything, if everything's nominal, then no. Um, we train most of our time in training is spent, obviously, for off-nominal situations. So from a manual flying standpoint, the most, uh, the probably the highest probability of something requiring manual flying would be either on a port relocation or a, a manual flyer, or sorry, a fly around of the station, or during docking or departure. Um, so in any of those cases, there's a number of you know technical things that could happen that would require you to manually intervene just to maintain. Uh, you know, distance and a safe, uh, a safe space from the ISS. But yeah, if everything's nominal, then it's mostly monitoring and sending commands that enable the next step. So there is a lot of manual intervention to allow the next automated sequence, if that makes sense. Given this is a new vehicle, are there any special checkouts that the crew or SpaceX will be doing on it uh, for its first time in space? Or is it 
a carbon copy of the uh, the past uh, crew missions? Uh, that's a really insightful question. So it's not it's not a carbon copy. There's definitely been manufacturing changes. So both from a production standpoint, uh, although the outer mold line is the same, uh, there's for example upgraded batteries. The solar cells are a little different. So there's there's definitely improvements. The uh, some of the fans inside the vehicle are also, you know, improved designs. So there's a number of uh, iterative improvements, but there's not a, I would say, a dedicated, you know, during the free flight portion test checkout of those. And that has to do mostly because of the fact we get, we get a lot of that benefit by having, you know, incremental fixes integrated in things like Cargo Dragon, where we can see and test those out as well. And then the, from a, a vehicle control standpoint, um, we don't expect any handling changes that would necessitate redoing the manual the manual controlling to, to revalidate the model. And once you get up to ISS, um, what, what uh, activities are you most looking forward to during your, during your, during your increment? Uh, I think for me, the science, I mean, the real reason I think I kept applying to NASA was the ability to, to go do science. And it's really, I think, cool now being in the sign flow and actually getting to interact with some of the scientists who came up with the experiments and realizing that you're there, you know, you're, we are their extension of the brilliance in their mind to go do it and make it happen. And for me personally, the ones I, I most, that I think are most meaningful to me are ones that have to do with, you know, bettering the, you know, it, making some of the climate problems, I think, better on earth in terms of, you know, what are better ways to generate oxygen, better ways to scrub carbon dioxide, better ways to conserve and reuse water. All the things that, that definitely are required to go to the moon and Mars, but also have the benefit of, you know, potentially solving existential problems here on earth and to me that's that's what i'm most excited about is a you know being a very small piece of that overall effort but being the person that can help further that technology and potentially find results that that solve major problems here uh, here for us on the on the earth do you expect to have a chance to do any spacewalks uh so there's definitely the potential for that so we have uh if you're familiar with the irosa system which the the solar the new solar panels and so there are some expected uh some expected work with that in the next spring um there's also some potential work upcoming with uh, s-band antenna fixes and so those are all possible places where we could be called on to help with the uh, evas all four of us on the crew three mission are qualified to do VEA, so they They've got plenty of people to pick from. And, um, you know, it's one of those things that, uh, you know, it's obviously a cool thing to go do a spacewalk. Usually it means something's broke or needs to get fixed. So you, you don't want to hope for that to happen. But at the same time, it'd be obviously cool to do a spacewalk. But, um, yeah, we've trained. Uh, our pool training included getting ready to be able to do the IROSA upgrades. There's a thing called the radiator beam valve module that also has some work to be done. So we, we have done about four or five um, runs in the NBL, the big pool, where we practice that, that are, prep for potential things we would do on orbit. So we've seen a number of different uh, tasks we might do up there. And really it's a matter of balancing the schedule and you know the criticality of those things as they look at other stuff going on in the space station as to whether or not we do those while we're up there or not. Well, thanks Raj. Uh, we'll uh, see you at the launch and good luck. All right, thanks very much guys. Bye.